Tom, I love the fact that you didn't bring many bugs, but you brought, I'll say, evidence of the insects. So what do we have here? Well, first, Peggy, I'd like to thank you for in inviting me to be part of the show. Oh, um, certainly. And I'm very happy to show off some of the uh, insect, damage. insect <laughs> damage and some of the things. And I I'd want to thank uh, the folks at the Henrico and Hanover and, and Richmond Extension offices for helping me get this with the Master Gardeners. Um, fresh off the press here today is some insect injury. Um, one of the most important things about pest management is diagnosing the problem. What is the problem? Um, you can't manage it until you know exactly what it is. Right. And, yes. um, obviously, this is injury to a, a broccoli or it could be a cabbage leaf collard. It doesn't matter. But one thing I would like you to point out is that it's holes. It's chewing holes. You may think, duh, well, that's what that is. But making that connection that this was very likely a caterpillar, um, possibly a beetle, but it's getting you to diagnosing the problem to where there's certain kind of insects that, that may have caused this injury. In the very same field though, um, you may find these kind of starburst-like feeding areas. Almost obviously. like somebody peeled back part of the leaf. Yes, yes, that's, and it's much different than a hole that was chewed in the leaf. Mm -hmm. And this was caused by an insect that has a piercing sucking kind of mouth part that jabbed its stylets in there and liquefied the tissue and, and sucked it back out and it leaves behind these marks. This could be in a leaf. Um, in this case, the injury was actually caused by a bug with piercing mm -hmm. sucking mouth parts. And there's the insect right there, the culprit. And you may have actually seen the bugs when you went out there, but that is the one that caused it. Um, you can see their piercing sucking beak. That's the harlequin bug. Feeds on broccoli and cabbage and collards. Um, so that would be a step of just figuring out what it is that's eating, eating your crops. So we can um, think about sort of how the insect is you know, either chewing or piercing and sucking, and it'll help us determine what type of insect is, it exactly. is in our garden. Exactly. I have had calls where someone said, did this bug do that? And I'm like, well, it's a hole. Uh -huh. The bug has a piercing sucking mouth part, so no, it wasn't the bug, it was, it was this. So it's a, it's a great first step in diagnosing um, what might be going on. Sounds and good. another thing that you can use is frass. Yes, and frass. not everyone knows what frass is, but it is the excrement that insects mm -hmm. leave behind after they feed. And yes. this is a common occurrence, sadly enough, for a lot of gardens, um, especially in Virginia. So this is taken right from a garden in Richmond um, today. We have a lot of this this year. Um, so this see, is a squash. Right, this is a squash plant. I should have uh -huh. pointed that out. Um, could, could be pumpkin, could be, could be squash, it doesn't matter, either one of those. But the vine started dying and you start to go there and find out what, what is going on here. Is it, a, is it a disease? And you could notice that what is left behind is frass, and that is the excrement of something that was feeding in there. A lot of times, the insect that's going to leave behind frass is going to be a caterpillar. Very clear, evident um, injury. It's kind of an orangey looking frass. And this is squash vine borer, mm -hmm. a caterpillar that, that will bore into the, the uh, squash vines and ultimately kill that vine. Um, I had him here a minute ago, and, the, <laughs> and he gone. just escaped. So we will just assume that uh, he's there. That he was there, but it was clearly that was yeah. what caused it. Well, I think um, too, people see their squash or their, their um, zucchinis or whatever starting to wilt, and they go, "Oh, I have to water," and they water, and then they find, "Hmm, it didn't it do any good." It wasn't the water. Yep. And going down and doing some investigation, I'll be honest. I take a very long um, paper clip and I unfold it, and I just kind of start stabbing away. You can, you can control the problem that way. That's yeah. a very interesting. If you don't have that many squash plants, mm -hmm. you can really stop the damage um, that way. You're physically taking them out almost like, mm -hmm. a, like a knight, uh -huh. knight in shining armor, sticking Just them. Just piercing with them <laughs> in there. Sometimes so. two zucchini plants is too many. Anyway. Right, right. <laughs> but we also have with our fruit, not just in our stems and our leaves, but we have issues with some of our fruit that we need to be aware of. Yep, and this is... Another kind of borer, if, you know, in a sense, this is actually tomato fruit worm or corn earworm. It's the same worm that gets in the tip of the ear of corn. Um, we'll also feed on tomatoes, and it's called the tomato fruit worm in, in that case. But it is probably our most damaging pest of, of crops in Virginia. Um, it's called the boll worm when it feeds on cotton. Um, and it just attacks a lot of crops, 300 different plants, actually. Oh, my. Um, it's a busy little guy. And tomatoes are, can be hit really hard in Virginia, um, starting in mid-July 
and it just gets worse as you get into August and sometimes it, it just can be our most devastating pest of tomatoes. How um, would be the best way to control it? I'm, I'm a person who goes out and looks in my garden every day and so if I see that I can remove it and throw it away? Um, you know, it's, you, you can. You can find those when they're a lot smaller, but you need to catch them when they're tiny. Uh -huh. um, so it would just be going out to your garden often. Mm -hmm. The eggs are really hard to see. A moth comes and flies and she drops a little tiny egg. It, you almost can't see it. Um, it's a little white cream colored sphere. Um, and out of that hatches a little tiny caterpillar. And off um, it goes. Yeah. And if you can catch it early, yes, you can get it off of there. But the problem is you usually see the damage before you see the insect. Oh. So. Tomato fruitworm is a very, very difficult one to deal with. Um, but another tomato pest, yes. um, and I'm, so many people have seen this before, <laughs> and I think it is one of the most fascinating things. This is the tomato hornworm, or tobacco hornworm. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is actually alive, and that is the hornworm. But a lot of people have seen this, and these are these white clusters, cottony clusters that are on that. And this is a great illustration of biological control. These wasps occur naturally. Um, they are Cotesia, that is a, the genus of this wasp, that she will sting the hornworm. Uh -huh. That egg will multiply inside the hornworm into, into larvae, which will feed on the insides and then eventually crawl out and pupate. And what you see there is basically the pupal cocoons of the wasp. Coming on out. Yep. Yeah. And Every one of them is going to give rise to a new wasp, which will fly and find more hornworms. What you'll find as you get later and later into the summer is that more and more of them are parasitized. It's because you have a lot more parasitoid wasps than you do hornworms. So it's kind of a numbers game. Wonderful. Um, and they eventually will make sure that not all the hornworms will, will make it mm -hmm. and, and be there for next year. The good guys will win. The good guys finally win in the yes. end, but sometimes they've caused some damage to your garden before mm -hmm. then. Well, not all of them are good guys, though, Tom. And we've got, coming, coming down the pike, we'll say, um, we've got an insect that I think we all need to be aware of. Right. Yes, thank you for bringing it up, Peggy. Uh, this is the spotted lanternfly. Um, if you're in the Winchester area of Virginia, unfortunately, you probably have heard about this for the wrong reasons. And that is because this invasive pest, um, it first showed up in the US a few years ago in, in Pennsylvania and has since been spreading. It, it popped up in Virginia a few years ago, uh, Winchester area, and it was isolated to maybe a few blocks in the town of Winchester mm -hmm. originally, um, and it has since spread. Um, it is in multiple counties now. Probably the closest to the Richmond area is Albemarle. Um, they have found this insect. So it is yes. on the move and is one to be um, on the lookout for because it, it's an invasive species. Um, we have seen tree trunks completely covered by this, and it's kind of a pretty, pretty little, pretty thing. insect. Um, it definitely is. It's got, it's got warning coloration. Um, you see these reddish colors. Mm -hmm. It's warning predators and birds to to not feed on it um, because it picks up toxins from the trees that it feeds on, like Tree of Heaven. Yes. When it's a nymphal stage, it feeds on those trees um, and is then toxic to a lot of predators. So, one of the reasons why it's an invasive is because. Not too many things are killing it. No. It multiplies like crazy, um, and we have a terrific habitat for it. So it is spreading, um, and be on the lookout for it. Yes, and it's um, inhabiting more trees and attacking more trees than Alanthus. And you were saying in the garden you're finding it on cucumber, yes or no? Yeah, that's one of the uh, questions. I'm a vegetable entomologist, and one of the big questions is, OK, I know it feeds on trees. Um, is it going to attack vegetable crops? Well, first of all, the crops that it's probably most at risk for are wine grapes, grapes and hops. Um, but we have found that the nymphs also feed on cucumbers and cause a lot of damage. Wonderful. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank you for bringing in what I'll call the evidence of insects so that we can learn as we're looking at our gardens what's there or not and whether to dive in a little deeper and do a little bit more investigation. So Great. thank you. My pleasure.